great. So then let me see if I can go through this. So yeah, I mentioned this already. So we are again taking a closer look at the data management expert guide. So this is the, the online tool that SESTA has been developing. And last, um, or in the first session on Monday, we looked at the first five chapters from planning, organizing, processing, storing, and protecting your data. And today we want to look a little bit more about uh, on the archiving and publishing side and also on discovering data for reuse. So this is what we'll talk about today in a little bit more detail. Um, and again, the data management exit guide follows this sort of life cycle that Tom also uh, mentioned already in his presentation. So the idea from the DMAC is that for all of these different phases, it gives you a little bit of guidance on the things to think about to make your data more useful for others, but also to document it in a way that you can find back the information that you want about your data. Um, and in this case, and of course, because I'm working at a, at a data archive, we want to tell you a little bit about why archiving is important and why you might want to consider also storing your data for long term and making it available for others. So the archive and published paper is really about sort of different aspects of what do you do when your data is data collection is finished and um, sort of archiving and publishing serve two functions. So archiving really means that you put your data somewhere where it's preserved for the long term and long term uh, sometimes means for 10 years. So a lot of universities, at least in the Netherlands, I think have this, this guideline that research needs to be preserved for 10 years. But actually what we do at dance is we preserve it for for even longer so there's not necessarily an end date to this um, and the idea is also to look into making it sustainable and making it accessible in over 10 years basically so really preserving your data for long term and the aspect of publishing is more related to actually um, making your data findable and accessible to others and making sure that others can reuse information or at least know that this research was done and that you have um, contributed to this. So these are kind of the two aspects that this chapter describes in a bit more detail. Um, now, why would you archive or publish your data? Um, we talked a little bit about research and management open science already at the beginning of, the, of this uh, two-day workshop. And I think most of you probably have a heart for open science, otherwise you wouldn't be here. But some of the benefits uh, or sort of the reasons people would share data are outlined in the data management expert guide. So one of the things is that it can actually benefit your career. There have been a couple of studies that show that data sets that have, or actually papers that have uh, data sets attached to them that are accessible, will uh, get more citations, for instance. And it can also help you, you know, if you're the person that shares their data with others, to make collaborations and be seen as somebody who is open about their research and, and av available you know, to help others. So I think there are some career benefits there as well. Um, it also helps the scientific progress. So the more people can reuse data, the more questions we can answer and the, the more we can make use of what is already done. So often data collection is very time consuming and in the context of these large European surveys, so a lot of us probably are working with survey data, um, it's very useful to combine resources to collect data and then answer as many questions as possible with it. So there is a good reason for sharing data for enhancing the scientific process, progress. Um, it also becomes more and more the norm. So we're really moving towards open science and you see that people are more and more interested in not only publications but also in data and making sure that uh, you know your data is visible and your data is recognized so i think it's it's also in terms of a norm and if you are in a research environment where people do this then i think this might also be a good reason for you to do that as well and the last um, driver is ex in that sense external so funders or publishers can actually also require you to um to share your data so in the Netherlands, uh, NWO does that. And of course, there are restrictions when it comes to sensitive data, which we'll talk about in a minute as well. But in general, the idea is that research is funded by often the taxpayers and people should be able to uh, get back and also reuse what has been done. So your research data should not be locked up in your own drive, but should be there for others to reuse and understand. 
of course, while keeping sensitive sensitivity and privacy of the data subjects in mind. Um, so these are these are sort of some of the common reasons why people would archive uh, data. Um, then the question is, okay, what kind of data would you archive and how do you select your data for archiving or for publications? So I think uh, what also illustrates what's illustrated by Tom's presentation this morning, there might be data that you cannot share, cannot archive and cannot publish. So in that case, with the working together with Statistic Netherlands, there are clear guidelines on this is not, you cannot share that kind of data because it's too confidential. But there might also be, for instance, some data that is really large and maybe not that relevant for other studies. So it's good to think about what are the things that people can reuse, what are things that are useful to share for others, and um, think about that in your data management plan as well. Um, so one of the things that is important then is also to include this in your consent forms. So when you're preparing for your research, you probably have to, if you work with um, uh, humans, you probably have to go through an ethical committee approval and you have to ask for informed consent for the execution of the study. But if you there also already ask them if you have the consent to share the data, that can make it much easier to share the data under the GDPR. And uh, one thing that I want to mention here as well, which I'll talk about more in a minute, is that you can also archive data without making it publicly available. So it seems sometimes that people do not know that an archive has many, many options for you to, to archive your data, but also publish your data, for instance, with conditions and make it in such and publish it with an archive in such a way that you can still determine who can access the data. So this is something, I think one of the misconceptions that I would like to uh, get out of the world that you can still make your data fair and archive and publish your data without making it publicly available. So that is, uh, that is one thing that I want to mention and I'll talk about it more in a minute. So if we're talking about archiving and publishing data, there are multiple ways to publish data. So if you have, for instance, submitted a paper, sometimes the journals offer a, a supplementary material service where you can upload data. You might have an institutional repository at your, in, at your university. Um, there are also some general purpose repositories, for instance, Zenodo, which is something that um, Tom has already mentioned. And then there are uh, domain specific repositories. And then there's what we call trusted or trustworthy data repositories. And in this case, also domain specific. And this is what I want to focus on most because if you have options to publish and archive your data, actually um, either go with what your institution is, is asking you to do or um try and archive your data with a trustworthy digital repository and the reasons why we would recommend that is what i'm going to talk to you next about so a trustworthy digital repository or a tdr is basically a certified archive so that means that there has been some external evaluation of the archive and how they do their processes and to make sure that you put your data there and it's actually uh, it's actually safe and secure and they are not doing some weird things with your data right which is in contrast to some commercial uh, parties that might store your data but there might not be necessarily always as much uh, control over what happens with the data as you have with a certified archive so a certified archive in general has a couple of um, features so usually it serves a specific community and also offers support to that community. So for instance, in the context of DANS, we have uh, we are developing different data stations for different domains, and we offer support specifically to the social sciences or the humanities or uh, the archaeology community to make sure that we sort of serve the community and we also follow the standards that are determined by the community. And a researcher might not know those, but we do. So that is an advantage of going to a trusted archive or a certified archive because they follow the guidelines and also can give you advice. Um, it is also evaluated in this certification process that your data is stored safely and also for the long term. So we also usually offer curation of data. So for instance, last uh, uh, in the previous session on Monday, I talked about the file formats that might run out of 
that that might not be able you might not be able to open a file ten years later. So usually, what we do at an archive is we transform files into sustainable formats to make sure that this is available um, in the future. And what we also do at a, at a trustworthy digital repository is that we offer options for publishing data. So again, it means that you can archive, archive your data without making it publicly available and you still regain some um, uh, actions to who can access your data and under what conditions. So this is um, on the trustworthy digital repository. And what is actually nice about uh, an archive like Dance is that it helps you to make your data fair. So we talked about fair a little bit last time. It's sort of this buzzword that we all want to make sure our data is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And a researcher can do a lot, which is also what Francesca mentioned. Like you can do a lot by describing your data well, thinking about the processes, but some of the technical things are actually something that you need an archive for. So for instance, what we do at Dance is we make sure your, uh, your data gets a persistent identifier. So the UI that you also maybe know from papers um, and that UI can be used to find your data in a persistent way. We also make sure that your metadata can be found through the archive. So if you describe your data for yourself and you have a PDF with your data management plan, that's great. But of course that information should go out into the world, right? We wanna make sure that, that information is found and that others can find that information. And what by publishing your data, archiving your data um, at a trustworthy digital repository, you ensure that this information can be found through the archive and a little bit more about discovery later. And what is also nice is that you can specify a license and a reuse agreement for your data and we will manage that for you. So I'll talk about that in a minute more as well. So then the question is, okay, you understand that, hey, an archive is a nice thing for my data. Um, how do you find an archive for your data? So the first thing to do again, which we mentioned a lot, I think is ask about your institute's policy. So maybe they already have a connection with DANCE. So for instance, a lot of the uh, universities in the Netherlands make use of Dataverse NL, which is a, an institute repository service that DANCE offers. And by that, you're already sort of using our services and making sure that your data is, is stored safely and in a and documented well. So that is one thing to check whether your institute has certain policies, has collaborations with archives, and what they require you in terms of archiving. Um, if you if your institute does not do that, or if you're interested to see to, to watch a little bit further, you can also have a look at the SESTA archives in your country. So SESTA, as we mentioned last time, is the Consortium of European Social Science and Data Archives. And um, I have an, another slide in a minute, but we have a lot of different archives all around Europe that are specifically designed to help social scientists preserve and archive their data. And most of them are certified, so are a trusted digital repository. So this is one thing to do if you don't know whether, you know, your country has assess the archive, this would be a good way to do. And you can also use Re3Data, which is a registry of research data repositories to find a trustworthy digital repository. So Re3Data is a, a registry where you can look for a repository in your country and you can specifically look for repositories that are certified. And for instance, Dance is in there and a lot of the sister archives are in there. So you can also find us through this service. But I know that some people are joining us from outside Europe and um, maybe it's much more difficult for you to find a, find a repository, but this Re3 data um, registry might help you with that. And in addition, I should say that for instance, at Dance, we are not limited to um, archiving data from the Netherlands. So if somebody in general, we serve researchers from the Netherlands, of course, but if somebody has a data set, that is relevant for us and it's not too large. So um, th then you can also archive your data with us. So often repositories are not bound to researchers from one country, which might also be good for you to know. Um, and I should also mention that typically for individual researchers, uh, archiving with data is free of charge um, up to a certain amount of data. So if you have terabytes of data, it will be more problematic. But if you are a single researcher and you have maybe, a, let's say, something below a gigabyte of data, usually you can archive it for free 
with uh, this as the archives. But of course, the policy might differ, but that might be good to know because people are not aware. So just a little bit about, about DANCE. So DANCE is, um, the trustworthy, is a trustworthy digital repository, as I mentioned earlier. So we are certified and we are a service provider of SESTA and we are the service provider of SESTA from the Netherlands. So DANCE has the Core Trust Seal um, certification uh, amongst others, which is this most standard and sort of um, entry certification of archives. So this is something to look for if you are want to work with an archive to see if they have Core Trust Seal or are at least preparing for a Core Trust Seal application. And um, we operate in the Netherlands, but as I mentioned already, we also offer services uh, more general. And we are at the moment in the process of transitioning our archiving system to Dataverse, which is an open source uh, uh, software for uh, repository services. And the services we offer, you can see in this diagram. So we have data stations. Um, so at the moment, we still have a, a general archive, which is called Dance Easy. But in the future, at the end of this year, we will have different data stations for different domains, uh, all based on Dataverse technology. And we also offer this repository service for universities, which is called Dataverse Now, and uh, even a storage facility for people or larger archives that just want to have a backup storage of their own data. And all of uh, the data is saved in this data vault where it's securely stored and uh, preserved for the long term. So if you are a researcher and you want to uh, store your data and it falls into one of these domains, then uh, DANCE is a good contact person for you. But also on the map, you can see um, the other SESTA members and partners. So you can see that we have, uh, SESTA has archives and service providers all, all over Europe. And the best way is always to contact the SESTA archive of your country because they will be more aware of the regulations of your country and maybe already have some collaborations with your university. So a little bit about archiving personal data because we talked about personal data obviously a lot last, last um, Monday with the presentation from Emily. And we have, when it comes to personal data, there are special guidelines and also some things you might need to consider. So obviously all personal data needs to be um, stored and managed following GDPR. Um, and one of the most important things is that you have to gain informed consent for sharing the data. So thinking about this already from the start is very important. Um, you also need to minimize the amount of personal information in your data. So if you can anonymize your data set, that means that there's no personal identifiable information and we can, you can also not retrieve that in some way, then you actually don't have any personal data anymore and then you it's much more easy to share your data. If you, however, can only pseudonymize the data so you have still a key, so there's still a way of transferring the data uh, back to the identifiable information that is still considered personal data. And then you might need to uh, follow these um, additional guidelines. So usually if you have a data set that is not, has, doesn't have highly sensitive information and your data is pseudonymized, you can, you can, you probably be able to um, archive that with us. But there might be uh, some uh, limitations on what we can store in terms of highly sensitive data. And as Tom, for instance, mentioned, the data from Statistics Netherlands cannot never leave. So there, there are some restrictions. And the best way to see what is what happens for your own uh, study is to contact the archive and talk to them about it and also contact your support at your own institute. But we also are always happy to talk with you and see uh, what we can do. And um, developing sort of archiving solutions for highly sensitive data is something that a lot of people are working on and Dan's working on this as well in the Dataverse community and Odyssey. So it's a, it's a very hot topic. And I think we are always happy to share the sort of most recent developments with you. But this is um, important to consider. And what happens if you want to archive personal data is in the, in the context of dance, you will need a processing agreement. So if you, and there's more information on our website, but if you deposit personal data, you need to uh, uh, um, basically sign a processing agreement with us. And there are also some restrictions on the kinds of um, access conditions that you can get with us. So for instance, if somebody 
is depositing data at DANCE that contains personal information or is even pseudonymized, as I just mentioned. So anything that falls under the GDPR, you can only uh, give publish that with restricted access. And that is because the GDPR requires you to be able to remove participants whenever they revoke their consent. So we need to make sure that we know who has access to the data and that the data can be can be adjusted potentially. So we at Dance really pay a lot of attention that this is managed well and that you know there's no personal data sort of under open licenses available. And this is also an advantage for choosing a trustworthy digital repository over, for instance, a journal um, supplementary materials because they might not be aware of these issues as much and you might not have as much control as you have when you publish and archive your data with us. If you're interested to know more about uh, reusability GDPR and archiving your data with DANCE, um, there's this YouTube video where Emily, who presented last time and who also joined one of the breakout rooms to provide information, gives more information about this. And of course, this might be different for your own country, but um, I think it still gives you a good idea of how this works, at least in, um, in, a, in a SESTA archive like we are at DANCE. So then I want to talk a little bit about the licenses and the access. So as I mentioned already, if you archive and publish your data with us, you have options on access and uh, license conditions. So the access categories that usually an archive has um, range from open access to access for registered users and restricted access or even embargo sometimes. So in the case of DANS, you can either say my data is completely open, anybody can download it, or you can say my data is open, but it's only accessible for registered users, or you can say my data is restricted and then you can put your own conditions to this. So that means that if somebody finds your data in our archive, you will probably, you will get uh, contacted by that person. And then you can determine yourself whether that person gains access or not. And this is, so this is the condition that we usually use for personal, uh, anything containing personal data. And the second thing is um, next to the access categories, you can also choose a license. And there are various licenses um, in terms of creative commons, for instance, but also other licenses. And the DMAC gives a nice overview of the different licenses and what to choose. And also at DANCE, you can have uh, select different licenses and we're also always happy to support you there. So I'm not gonna go through the licenses in detail, but the DMAC does give an overview of these. And you can see the image also on the top. Um, yeah, DMAC provides guidance. And as I mentioned, indeed, so for uh, personal data is always with restricted access um, at DANCE, but it still means that it's published and available for people if they request access with you or with your supervisor or whoever you think is the person who should manage this. And then I want to talk a little bit about promoting your data because you, one of the reasons why you want to archive and publish your data with us is that once archived, you you can cite your data and you can actually also get credits for it. And the, the things we talked about before, the persistent identifiers for your data and the ORCID for yourself can actually help you with that. Because if you um, attach this data set basically to your ORCID record, then it will automatically show up in in your ORCID record and you will have this whole list of all of the things that you've published alongside with the papers, which I think is a really nice nice thing um, that can help you also you know, show others that you are responsible with your data and you're sharing it in a way that can be uh, reused for others. And there are a couple of tips that the DMAC lists on how, how you can actually make sure your data is reused as much as possible. And the first one is that uh, you should choose open access, which of course is not possible, as I mentioned just now in certain cases, but if you have data that is uh, that doesn't contain personal information, you can choose an open access license or you can choose an open access access category. And also licensing your data is very important because if you license, if you put a license on your data, people know what they can and cannot do. So sometimes you would think, oh, I just make it open access, I don't need a license. But actually, if you don't have a license, people don't know what they're allowed or not allowed to do with the data set. So really having a license for your data that is visible and, and an archive can help you with that 
is very important. And then you can cite your data using the DOI that you get from the archive. Um, there are also ways of publishing data in a data journal, for instance. Um, and what they also recommend is, for instance, teaching with your data set, making it an example. Um, and some data repositories also promote your data. So for instance, at DANCE, we also have, uh, we have newsletters about new data sets coming in sometimes. And, and we also, we are always happy to help people promote their data. Um, and then you can also read a little bit about altmetrics, so which is also sort of linking data sets to your social media, et cetera. So basically, if you publish and archive your data at DANCE or another repository, it can help you to increase your impact as a researcher. And that was what I wanted to talk about for the publishing uh, chapter. And then the last, or in a way, it could also be the first chapter of the DMAC is discovery and discovery of, of data. Um, and there it's really about reusing data. So if you've done everything we've discussed so far, then your data should be reusable for others. But there's obviously also a benefit for yourself to reuse data. So um, the DMAC lists a couple of the benefits that there are for reusing data. And um, just to mention them really briefly, but reusing data can often save costs and time. So at the beginning, I mentioned, for instance, the large uh, European studies, uh, like the, the big surveys, you know, they ask a lot of questions to participants once, and then they reuse the data. And many, many people, for instance, use the ESS for their studies because it's very cost costly to um, ask sur survey people and to interview people and reusing that is uh, saves cost and time. Um, you can also use, uh, for instance, uh, older data sets to uh, compare results or make replication studies. And I find it always very nice if, for instance, a PhD student that goes into a, a specific topic in a particular lab also sort of replicates what has been done previously because I think the value of replication studies can be a bit um, misrepresented as it's really important for us to see that data and, and results actually replicate. Um, and you can also reuse verified elements of research design. So for instance, reusing code or reusing specific questionnaires that you can also share in an archive can really help you to uh, uh, make sure that you have, uh, that saves you time as well. Um, and it can also enhance the data quality and foster innovation. So if you look at existing data sets and existing standards, that can also help you in your own research process. So if we're talking about discovery of data, there are sort of these five steps that are outlined in a little bit more in detail in the data management expert guide. So the idea is that you first sort of need to start thinking about the what you really need and then check the appropriate resources, uh, think about the query, and then select data sets and evaluate the data quality. Um, and in theory, we would of course hope that everybody looks at our data archive, but oftentimes people start Googling data. Um, so it's typing something in Google, but actually what we're doing now at data archives is also making our data and metadata that we have in the archive more discoverable through Google. So using sort of technologies of the web, and documenting the data, the metadata that we get at the archive in certain ways makes it actually also discoverable through Google. So even if you're not searching through a data archive, you might still be find data from our archive through Google because we are ensure that the findability through Google is enhanced. And um, nevertheless, data archives can really be data resources. So at DANCE, for instance, we have uh, a lot of data sets that you can find through our interface and all of the data sets that are archived can also be uh, found through that and usually at least the metadata is also openly available so if you're interested to look at data archives as a resource you can look at the SESTA archives and on the DMAC there's also a list of a certain other archives outside of SESTA and non-European archives and other important data repositories so if you're interested um, to check out repositories in your area. This is, I think, nice to look at the data management expert guide. But as I mentioned earlier, you can also find data through Google, obviously, and we're really trying to make our um, data sets more available. 
And uh, that being said, SESTA actually is developing or has been developing a, a, a catalog of European data sets. So all of the SESTA archives are, uh, are actually harvested by their larger catalog. And you can find an overview of all of the SESTA data sets there, which I think is also really nice. Um, and then if you're interested in specific sources, so for instance, in this case, the DMAC outlines a couple of resources for aging, international comparisons, so some of the international survey studies and other curated data sources. And there's also a section on finding social media data. So if you're interested in this, I would recommend to have a specific look at the data management expert guide to see whether any of these might be interesting for you to find data for your specific project. And then I wanted to mention, uh, and this is, I think, the last one of the last things I want to mention is the, the ODC portal. So it has been mentioned already at the beginning of the day by Tom really briefly. Um, so ODC is working on a, a single place where uh, social scientists can find data sets from mainly from the Netherlands. So the idea is what we're doing now is that um, we are integrating metadata from various providers and aggregating that in one portal. So at the moment, if you're interested in data from DANS, you have to go to DANS. If you're interested to, in data from CBS, that is actually really difficult to find because their, their data is very much protected, but the metadata could theoretically be available for researchers. So what we are trying to do is locating all of these different data sources and putting them in one place that is well documented and also that where this information can be outputted again, for instance, through TESTA and through others so that we make it more findable. And the idea of the portal is also that we enrich this information that we receive with semantic technologies. And we also want to link everything into a graph that can be queried to make it easier for researchers to find information that is linked and to make it easier to find data sets that might be relevant for them. So this is um, still work in progress, but it's, I thought something that would be nice for you to know. And if you're interested, I recommend you sign up to the ODC newsletter to get um, updated on this regularly. Um, and then the last thing I wanna say is about the access use and citation of data, because once you've found the data, it's also important to credit the people that have been working on the data. And basically this sort of sum summarizes everything that we've discussed in these two days, because when you have provided all of the information that you collected in your data management plan to the archive and sort of enrich this documentation of your data and then publish it in a, in a license, make it accessible, then uh, people can reuse it in the most optimal way. Because if you want to reuse data, you need all of that information that the data depositor provides to the archive and that you have collect collected in your data management plan. So important things are the access conditions, the license information, and also citation. So again, these persistent identifiers, so the, the DOI of your data set and the ORCID of the researcher can be very, very helpful for people to cite your data set and also make sure that the credits again come back to you in a way. So that is what we are ultimately hoping to um, help people with. And that was what I wanted to share with you. So thank you very much for your attention.